Greetings to the churches in the Mid-America region of the Disciples of Christ. It's an honor to be speaking to you. Uh, my name is Richard Ward, recently retired from Phillips Theological Seminary and uh, teaching homiletics and worship. And I bring you greetings from my home in Denver, Colorado. Blessing, grace, and peace to you. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. Since then, there is encouragement in Christ, consolation in love, sharing in the Spirit, compassion and sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full of cord and of one mind. Do do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, and heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in, your pre in my presence, but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work with you, enabling you both to will and to work for God's good pleasure. Will you pray with me now? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'd like to tell you one way that I've dealt with social isolation in the pandemic. Now, one thing I like to do in normal times is meet a friend for lunch, but often that just hasn't been available, so... Instead of that, I sit down in my own, at my own table in my own home, and if my wife isn't working, I'll start browsing YouTube. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how YouTube can kind of figure out what you might want to look at. I guess it's because I've liked all these things from time to time, like well, here might be a free lesson in blues guitar playing. Or there might be um, uh, highlights from my favorite newscast the night before or even early that morning. Or I might even get to listen to Mark Shields and David Brooks talking about the events on NPR with Judy Woodruff of the previous week. But sometimes there are series, there's a series of things that really catches my eye. Like recently there, a series has, has come up that has, has these key words in the title. What life was like as. So at lunch, while I was in isolation, I could explore what life was like as a Viking, or as a Spartan, 
or as a slave in Egypt or a slave in Rome. One that I really liked was you could explore what life was like as a Roman legionnaire. Now, for the life of me, I couldn't find the video that would show me what life was like as a Christian in ancient Philippi. Uh, I looked, but I couldn't find anything like that. But guess what? We have a letter. And if we peek through the lines of that letter, I think we can get a pretty good picture of what life might have been like if you had been a Jesus follower in the city of Philippi. The letter begins like this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't have a return address, but we know the destination. The ancient city of Philippi. Now, if I had lived my life as a member of the Roman Legion and I had served my 25 years of service, I might have Philippi as my destination. Because did you know that there was a, a retirement home for veterans of the Roman army. Yeah, I could go to Philippi and had and 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 be among other veterans who had, if they had survived the Roman wars, could have lived life in prosperity. Indeed, it should be no surprise if I had given my life in service to the emperor that I would want to go to a place where it was the center of the imperial cult. It was a tightly organized society, a hierarchy, and at the top was the emperor, who was worshipped as a god. If I had served the emperor, then I certainly would have an honored place in that hierarchy. I'd be very much at home. I would enjoy the respect of my peers since I had risked my life to preserve the Roman way of life. In fact, the gospel of Rome, the good news that Caesar and his legions had successfully brought peace and prosperity to the whole world and greater wealth to those who were privileged enough to be citizens of the Roman Empire. You know, for that reason, that, that Caesar had done this great work, many called him Savior and called him Lord. Saved them from the chaos that was just beyond the border of the empire that threatened to come in and disrupt their way of life. Meanwhile, somewhere in the bowels of that vast empire sat a less than honorable citizen of Rome. Not in a place of honor, but imprisoned for service to his Lord, Christ Jesus the kind of society that he's been promoting in his preaching and in his letters that go out from that prison, the kind of society is called koinonia, which we would call now as church. It's organized around the mind of Christ, not the laws of Caesar. Koinonia was the place where in the eyes of God, there was no social hierarchy. In fact, as Paul says in another letter, there was no difference between Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. So that vision of society had taken root in that part of the world, and one of those places was Philippi. In now in Paul's heart and mind as he's there in that prison is a community of faith that is patterning its life not around the Roman way of life, but around the way of Christ. 
around a different son of God who did not, like Caesar, rise up from an elite family and through the ranks became divine, but one who was from the beginning in the form of God. But then, having been born in human likeness, did not express pride and arrogance as being from God, but, in fact, humbled himself to the point where he died on a Roman cross. Now, when that little group in Philippi heard Paul preach that gospel about this downwardly mobile Christ, they didn't just keep it in their head as one of many propositions for how to live your life. They took it to heart. And now, in the name of that Christ, their Lord, they were blessing the poor, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, bringing, bringing resources where they were needed, not ignoring the poor and, and the homeless and the hungry, not putting them down, but taking the form of a servant themselves and treating those without status and privilege in the Roman hierarchy as children of God, not as people who are locked in some kind of social organization. Now, a community living out that kind of life is certainly blessed. But sometimes what it is that binds that community breaks when pressure is applied. So as they have lived their lives, Paul has heard, a letter has come, that they've gotten into trouble. Paul wonders what kind of trouble. Was it the good trouble that comes with following Christ and imitating him, or was it the other kind? The kind when gospel values and virtues collide with social values and virtues and pride and arrogance and hunger for status take root even in the, this alternative community. So Paul's letter to the Philippians that we have across this vast chasm of time is an example of what can be heard and what can be said to a community that's both blessed and broken. Now, if we look at the letter itself in its entirety, we can get a glimpse of what it might be that's threatening to break this community apart. It seems that two prominent leaders, two prominent women in the community have been fighting and the community itself was taking sides and lining up with, like, with one against the other. Not only that, but there, there was coming through a group of of apostles, a group of preachers that were challenging Paul's credentials. Paul, the one who had established that community, they were saying, well, he doesn't have the right interpretation of the gospel. And so back and forth, the accusations went. Now, if that was all there was to the Philippian story, oh, it wouldn't be good trouble. It'd be bad trouble indeed. But still, even, even in the midst of all that squabbling going on and challenging and disagreement, some good things were happening. Paul writes that the same mind that was in Christ Jesus was in them. What, what was the evidence? Well, some were offering words of encouragement to someone else who was feeling down and 
disillusioned. Someone was consoling someone else in love, perhaps over the loss of a loved one. There seemed to be a spirit of sharing among them. They were feeling compassion for each other, at least to some degree. Sympathy was being offered, probably because trying to live out the kind of life that, that they were trying to live, the way of Christ, brought suffering, humiliation, maybe even hostility. So, when the Philippians opened that letter and heard it read aloud to them, they recognized themselves in it. Just like when we have it read to us and read it for ourselves, we recognize ourselves. We sure know what it is like to be in bad trouble these days. And frankly, when I read about the problems that the Philippians were experiencing or seemed to be experiencing so long ago, what they're suffering through, it pales in comparison to what I think we've been suffering through. Do I even have to name those problems for you this morning? You hold them in your heart. You feel it too. Ah, you know, after I read this letter, I thought, well, that just doesn't seem very serious. I mean, church squabbling and quarrels over leadership. The stake seems much higher now. Still, whether you're in Philippi or whether you're in the churches of today, trouble is still trouble. The pressure of living in a culture that's so hostile or even indifferent to gospel values and virtues, virtues like compassion and empathy the ability to feel suffering with someone instead of looking out for your own self-interests. Humility seem in such short supply. And because the culture doesn't seem to hold up the values that the gospel teaches us and the gospel wants us to live out, the pressure of that kind of culture can threaten to break you and break your community apart. Brokenness. I get together with my fellow Christians every Sunday um, at the 6th Avenue United Church of Christ in Denver. Now, these days, we're not meeting in the church, but I suppose, like most of you, we're finding other ways to gather. Well, we've decided to gather on Zoom. And when we gather, there comes a time when we talk about our joys and our concerns. And two days after Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, during that period of time in worship, one of our members said, after she heard of Ginsburg's death, she said, I feel broken. Now, we don't have a letter that the Philippians wrote to Paul. But maybe, maybe in that letter, something of that sentiment was shared. Something that might have been voiced like this. Paul, the pressures of living in this society that's so hostile to what we believe is the way to live is so hard. It's so strong. We feel broken. We need help. 
So what Paul said in response to them might have been startling. My beloved, he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. As if to say, I'm not in a position to rescue you. I can't come now, but listen, you're all grown up now as a church. The mind of Christ is in you. Rest assured. You all have what you need within your own community to live a life worthy of the gospel. You're already doing it. You're already serving others. You've already acted with humility and compassion and encouragement. You might feel broken right now, but even in your brokenness, you are blessed because because it's God that is at work in you. So make my joy complete. Go ahead. Be the church that you know you can be. Now, I, I think that if Paul, somewhere in the communion of saints, knew us and knew the kind of trouble we feel like we're in, we knew what was causing us to fear and tremble for our salvation, our survival, he might say something like this to us. Look, church, churches in mid-America, churches everywhere, no one is coming to save you. from the consequences of living out the gospel. There's no consultant. There's no super pastor. There's certainly no politician. You are going to have to work out your own salvation. In the midst of your fear and trembling, you're going to have to figure out in your own place what it's like to be a faithful servant, not by yourselves, not some lone ranger, but together, living a faithful witness together, a life worthy of the gospel. Now, that might sound like bad news, but listen to this, Paul might say, you're ready for this. Like the psalmist says, you have a goodly heritage. You're all grown up now. You're into full maturity now as a church. You have what it takes because there is in you, by God's grace, the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ is guiding you. Well, that's what Paul might have said to us had he known what we were going through. But I want you to listen to what one of our own leaders has said. Stephen Charleston is a Choctaw leader, originally from Oklahoma, and has been a bishop in the Episcopal Church. And he puts it this way. Now is the moment for which a lifetime of faith has prepared you. All of these years of study, all of those worship services, all the time devoted to that community of faith you're a part of, it all comes down to this. This sorrowful moment when life seems so chaotic and the anarchy of fear haunts you. Your faith has prepared you for this. It's given you the tools you need to respond to proclaim justice while standing for peace. You see, long ago the Spirit called you to commit your life to faith. And now, at last, you know why. 
You are a source of strength for those who have lost hope. You are a vision of calm in the midst of chaos. You are a steady light in these days of darkness. The time has come to be what you believe. My beloveds, God is at work. God is at work in us, assisting us to be what we believe for God's good pleasure.